Well, it's 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 great to have you. Great to have you back in Munich after what almost 30, 30 years. You're kidding. Uh, I was here last year. I, I'm visiting Munich quite no, I often. I mean, well, yes, ah. officially. No, no, you, you, you're forgetting that I did the post-production of this movie called Duel here, in the, called Enemy at the Gate. Ah, yes. I, I did it in Bavaria, and I lived, I had the pleasure to live in Bavaria. That was in 2001, I think, uh, for another nine months. You didn't know? No, I didn't know. Nobody, nobody told me. He knows nobody nothing. And, uh, he's going to interview me, and he N has not, no, no knowledge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, it's, it's just like it's just like in my own family. I'm always the last person to. Uh, so, especially, especially. Well, before when you were here, you weren't out in the sticks in Bavaria. You were downtown, Constantine film, in the heart of town. No, so, I was. I was more in the heart of town. I, 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 I home in Munich was Frauenstrasse, and I had a terrace looking on the Victorian Market. Another information. <laughs> okay, getting to, uh, to your films. <laughs> well, in, in, during the shooting of the bear, I also read that you got a love tap from a bear, which uh, um, well, I'll, I'll, was I'll, quite painful. Well, you know, what, what, what happened is um, I, I, I did a terrible mistake during that shoot. I did the usual picture, you know, of the director with a star. My star was a bear. The bear, his shoulder was here. When he was standing, you know, that was the measure. So it was an immense bear. And uh, in order to, you know, uh, I know you have always to flatter your actors. So I, I took my, my, my I, I went very, you know, like this and, and took my viewfinder. And the bear had never seen me like this, pointing at him a, a, a strange object. So he came down, whoa, like this. And he did the following. You're going to be afraid. No. Yeah. You know what he did? He went this. This, in bear language, means you're dead. <laughs> Very fortunately, I remembered the lesson from Umberto Eco. Uh, it was in the name of the Rosa line where um, uh, William of Baskerville was saying to the student, you have to read because it may one day save your life. And I had read a book called Bear Attacks by, uh, I swear, by Stefan Herrero. By the way, the man gave me the worst review ever because bear specialist and um, he wrote some terrible things about the movie, but that's another thing. Uh, in his book, it was said that if a bear attacks you, you have to protect your bowels and your eyes. So I did that. Um, it lasted for, I, I felt a century, but uh, only 20 seconds. Um, and I was thinking that I was probably going to die in the scent of shit because he was covered with his own manure. And it was very, very strong smell. Anyway, um, his, his trainer was saying, oh, but good boy, good boy. Not really a good boy, you know, but. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the bear got t tired. He, he had this dead guy, you know, uh, because the book was saying, pretend you're dead. So I pretended I was dead. And of course, the, the bear had done what he wanted, kill me. And then he walked away. Then I stood up and um, checked if everything was working. It was, but my assistant went and said, what's happening to your genes? Well, I had a fountain of um, red going along my uh, leg. Then he took me to the, it was during the pause. And during that sh shoot, it was a very boring shoot. I, so I used to, took all kind of, you know, strange hats and all that. And I appeared in front of my crew that was twice as large as you today. And they all laughed because I was covered with blood and thing. And they think I was joking. As a matter of fact, no, I went to the uh, tent with, that we had prepared in case of an accident. I remember this thing. I, I usually don't show my back too much. Um, but <laughs> my assistant took my jeans out and he looked at my back 
And I remember he said, oh, this doesn't look good at all. And, <laughs> and then I was transferred to the hospital. And um, I remember it was in Austria. It was a gigantic nurse. She came with a roll of um, gauze. And there was a lot of attraction. A lot of surgeon doctors came because that was the first time that in the um, um, Austrian Alps, a French director was um, hit by a, a grizzly bear from America. <laughs> so it was a very interesting <laughs> item. And uh, they all looked at my back and they were all saying, oh, it looks so bad. So I was embarrassed. <laughs> and this is this big nurse. She comes and she starts going brum, brum, like this. And I'm thinking that they're going to put it around. No, they put it inside. <laughs> inside the hole that I had. Another hole. Uh, not, uh, <laughs> a new one. <laughs> and um, I had to go to hospital every morning and every evening for two months. Uh, it was quite serious. Uh, yes, thank you for your question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, another thing but that just, just one second. Uh, with Quest for Fire, how did your, it was, it was the first movie you did with Ron Perlman. How did you, did, was it just an ordinary casting thing or, uh, but it was the beginning of this long, wonderful relationship. Well, let me tell you the story from Ron Perlman's point of view. Uh, Ron Perlman is a want-to-be actor in New York. And for the first time, he receives an invitation to show up at a casting session. So he gets to the address, he's all excited. And, you know, Ron Perlman is a man with a st strong face, let's put it this way. Yeah. Uh, and he gets into the room and he sees people with also strong faces, a real strong. And he got so depressed. So now he comes into the room and he sees this. Now, I'm quoting his memoirs. I, I, I've just received his book. And he says, and here is this fancy director dressed in Gucci um, <laughs> <laughs> dress was uh, explaining that I should behave like a caveman. What does he think I am? And he does something to insult me. And he goes, <laughs> <laughs> He's terrific. So I'm saying, I'm taking you. And he doesn't to, want to believe it. Now, I have, I have my producer, Michael Graskoff is his name. He says, you can't use him. He, he looks like a Jew from the Bronx. And I remember, I, I, he is a Jew himself, you know. And I said, Michael, they were already around. <laughs> I swear. <laughs> and then, only then, the guy, uh, Ron Perlman, understood that uh, I was this guy that uh, at the Academy Award, he saw my film, and then he r realized it was a serious movie. But, um, uh, you know, it was a terrible, terrible shock for him. And, and then, I, I must say, I admired his work enormously, became my good, good, good friends. And then I hired him again for Name of the Rose. Um, uh, for Name of the Rose, I remember the following. Um, because it was a co-production between Germany, Italy, and France, I n had to have a few Italian actors. And I had to have a Im important character. And I ha uh, planned to, to hire a comedian a guy with a TV show. Um, and in the meantime, I had said to Ron Perlman, I said, Ron, uh, the, the part would be for you, but um, uh, there's no way I can hire you. And uh, he understood. Then I uh, had a problem with this Italian actor. Um, I told him, and wrote on contract, that he should shave his head, because, you know, he, he was playing the name of Salvatore, a guy who would be like this, and he, he was supposed to have a hair disease, and um, how do you call this hair disease, you know? Uh, well, it doesn't. <laughs> okay. Anyway, this Italian actor uh, is saying, oh, yeah, I'll shave tomorrow, and now we are on Saturday before... I shoot on Monday. 
And I said, sir, now it's time to do the haircut. It's, uh, each time he would come with a fake head, he looked like Frankenstein, you know. Uh, <laughs> he said, well, listen, you know, I can't cut my hair because I'm on TV show. This is my style. And I, I won't cut my hair. And I said, I'm sorry. If you don't cut your hair, you're fired. Bernd Eichinger shows up, and of course, he agrees with me. And here is the story now from Ron Perlman, in the meantime, didn't get a, a job. S from Quest for Fire, Nemo the Rose, no job. Became a limo driver. Just got fired. And he's in his bedroom in New York, and he's saying to himself, something has to happen to me, something nice has to happen to me. The telephone rings. It's Bert Eichinger's assistant, Anna Gross. She says, uh, Ron, uh, do, do I wake you up? Uh, are you free tomorrow? Uh, I say, yeah. Are you free for the next month? Yeah. Are you free for the next three months? Yes. All right. There is a plane. He, he, she doesn't, she forgets to explain this to play Salvatore. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you have to jump. There is a plane in uh, now uh, uh, at Kennedy Airport. You, the, the ticket is booked for you. Just go there, run. <laughs> he took his laundry bag, dirty laundry, put it together, took a taxi, gets in Rome. In Rome, hey, Ron, come. I take him to the hairdresser room, and I shave him <laughs> with spots, you know. And I remember he looked at him, he looked at me, laughed and cried and laughed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for almost a year, he had to wear a hood. <laughs> what I did to him was terrifying. Um, uh, he remained my friend. <laughs> yes, sir. Ah, well, uh, something happened in my life, which was that um, when, when I finished uh, film school, um, I started uh, unexpectedly, I was asked to do commercials, and I was doing one a week. I couldn't believe I was 19 and a half and shooting every week, you know. Um, and then, uh, I totally forgot that in those days you, you had to be in uniform for one year. Uh, and I was suddenly sent to Africa to teach cinema. And I said to myself, I, I can't. It's the beginning of my, my career. And, uh, but no way. You know, I tried to escape, but no way. I was sent to Cameroon with the conviction that I would hate it. The door of the plane opened. I fell in love. <laughs> I swear, I fell in love. I loved the smell. And there was a gendarme, you know. It, 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 it was a very, very wrong fat guy. It was a little short. It was made for some gendarmes in the middle of France, not for a gendarme uh, that was eating well in Cameroon. And he had a little cap that was very too short for him as well. And he had been told to be very serious. So he was saying, circulate, circulate, <laughs> circulate, circulate. <laughs> I said, I love him. I just love him. It's, it's wonderful. And uh, I spent a year of amazement. I f fell in love entirely with Africa, promised myself to do my first movie in Africa about Africa, which I did. It was called Black and White in Color. Total flop in France. I got an Academy Award. <laughs> <laughs> best film, best foreign film, very good. Um, when I was in Africa, it changed entirely my life. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll t even tell you an anecdote. In those days, I was uh, learning Latin and Greek, still at university, a great fan of Baroque music. And I'd taken with me a, a, a few records. Uh, in those days, they were v v nines, v nines. Vinyl. Vinyl. I, I always mispronounce that word. And uh, first Saturday, I go on the top of a mountain, Yaoundé, and I put the Stabat Mater of Pergolesi, 
wonderful duo at the beginning. And I'm alone on this mountain. And in the village down below, there is a wedding. And while it goes, ah, I'm hearing, bum, 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 bum. And I'm saying, ah, I forgot about the rhythm. I forgot about the rhythm of my heart. I, I know the melody, I know the subtlety of a, a boy uh, and a cello. I didn't understand anything about the heart. And I, I just changed. And also the big lesson was that a lot of people around didn't speak my language, but I understood them better than my colleagues at the, at the film school that were so pretentious, you know. And over there, the guys, I remember the old men, they'd take my hand like this, and they would look at me for half an hour. And I knew what they meant. <laughs> no, but frankly, it's, it was wonderful. And then I decided that soon after my first movie, I decided that I would make a movie about us, uh, the universal us, uh, w the common roots about body language. You know, I'm often asked now, oh, how is it that you can make a, a movie in China not speaking the language? Well, do I need to speak the language if I take my viewfinder, I do this, you know, and then that, and then this, you know? Well, the guys are already with the dolly. Uh, they understand I want a dolly. If I say to my actor, you sit here, and I sit over there, and I don't look at you, and you speak to me, and I'm like this, uh, this is the es essential. How they pronounce it, who cares? You're going to see the movie in German anyway. Uh, <laughs> so, so, you know, um, I, I, I'm very uh, touched with the universality of, of people. And after that, I understood that it's not limited to people. I can also identify with them with a fly, with a frog, a frog, a frog you can understand why. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I just l love opening my, myself to others, especially if they're different. <laughs>